that I've been outside of the city, so that's very strange. Um, we're going to have a we have a question and answer thing going here, so please do ask any questions you want. There's a little question box. If you can see it, I don't know. Can you tell me if you can see the question box, and then I'll know for sure. Um, and if not, just ask the questions in the comments. I'll scroll up, but much easier to ask the questions through the little question box. That's cool. Um, and yeah, again, hello. Nadia will be here in a moment. So I just wanted to, to you know, let everybody settle in. I know, I mean, it's, it's Instagram. I guess we're all settled in because it's Instagram. No question box. That's a problem. Okay, let's see if I can fix that on my end. Question for my viewers, Joe, up here. Whatever. You just you can ask any questions. Before Nadia comes here, if you have any questions for me before I get started with everything or before we get started, um, please let me know. Uh, I don't see question box. Yeah, there's. I guess there's no question box. Um, so I run a publishing company in New York City. It's called Chris Graves Projects. Uh, we're giving thirty percent off uh, tonight. The code is Blue Sky, um, and the and it ends at midnight. I guess I didn't put that in there, but it ends at midnight. So if you want some less expensive books, uh, you can get them before midnight. Uh, this is a book named Big Throat that we're pre-ordering for right now by a photographer named Nat Ward with this awesome ass cover. Uh, and while well, it's, uh, well, I'm not going to talk to you about the end. end. Anyway, uh, this is a book by, uh, Laurent Chevalier named Enough, which we just came out with also nice and nice. I, I love this book. I love both. I love all these books. Of course I love the books. Um, and this is a set of books named Lost, which is, uh, eight photographers photographing eight places around the world. I'm guessing this is going to be backwards because why would it be forwards? I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Anyway, um, there's no option for it to be forwards. Don't get it. Anyhow, uh, we have a, a book by a man named Keely Yuyan, who is a photographer based in Seattle, who photographs the, uh, well, this is called Chukotka, and it's a, a huge section of Russia, um, Northeast Russia, and he's photographed the like landscape as well as the community of people that live there. So that's that book. We have a book by a Montreal-based artist named Tess Roby, um, named, uh, well, Montreal, uh, and that's here. Uh, we have The Glittering Eye by Courtney Estalos and Michael Hicks, I, or Michael W. Hicks, I should say. Sorry if you're on the call. Sorry. Uh, I see Nadia just joined the call, so I'll get her in here in a moment. This is a uh, book by Alina Van Ryzen named Bryn Mawr from her college experience at Bryn Mawr. Dope ass book. Uh, New York, by, New York Mostly on Sundays by Jet Devine. He is my mentor. I don't know if he thinks he's my mentor. I don't know. He probably doesn't know he's my mentor, but he, he was my uh, a purchase college professor when I went to school, so we made a book with him about the 70s in New York, like empty downtown scenes. It's a book by a photographer named Haley Austin named The Springs, which is Las Vegas, pretty much. So like all the craziness that happens in Las Vegas. I won't actually go through these books much. And, okay, there's more. This is actually called Tearing Down the House of God. And it's a book by um, Marilyn Rye and Kenneth Rye. Her father is the photographer for this book that was made in the 70s. And I am not in Portland. I'm in, well, I, we'll get to that. Uh, this is a, a book about the pre-revolution Afghanistan in the 70s. Um, and it's pretty interesting. It's like, it's a, it's a story, it's poetry. It's a story as well as, as well as a photography project. Um, and this is Nadia Nakorda's book, A Special Kind of Double which uh, we'll go through tonight a little bit, and I'm going to let her join the call now. No, I'm not in Portland. I am Brewster, Massachusetts. I'm Cape Cod right now, and I'm from Queens. So. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Can you, can you, yes, I, I now can't hear myself in your voice. So great. Uh, all good. Um, want, let's, can you move slightly farther back from the camera? Is that possible? Yeah. Because seems like there's a lot of like, uh, so much text anyway, but you look good. How's it going? Yeah, it's better. Uh, but I think I can hear myself. Can you turn me down on your side just a little bit? Possibly? Yeah, let me know. How's that? Ah! Ah, I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to see you. Um, I do. Do you already have? You have your drink 
get everything ready? You're, you're, you're I do, I do. It's right. It's, well, it's next to you guys, but yeah, it's right here. Good. Uh, well, th thanks for being here with us on this Blue Sky call tonight. Um, I don't know if you actually have seen your book yet. Do you have it? Oh, that's good. I do! So glad it got to you that the post service, Postal Service is uh, screwing up. I mean, they're, they're, they're real slow on the um, on the everything these days. But I'm glad you got it. Do you, is it okay? It's decent? Yes. No, I'm, it's, I was just telling a friend that um, it's, like, so wild to see it in person and to like actually physically like have it here. Um, it's yeah. amazing. Oh, awesome. We'll talk about it more. Like the problems we'll talk about out off the call. We'll figure it all that if there are already problems, but uh, I just want to like introduce people to you. Can you please let people know like, uh, well, anything about you? I think that if, as far as, uh, more people will join as we go on, but I was interested, like where you from, uh, how did you get to Syracuse? You're in Syracuse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was born in Detroit, um, and then grew up in Michigan, um, sort of like, you know, my parents were divorced, so I lived between, like, the suburbs of Lansing, um, which is more, like, central to the state, and then between there and Detroit, um, yeah. so I would, like, literally go the, like, hour to 15 minute drive, like, back and forth for pretty much my entire life until I was about in high school, um, and then moved back to Detroit, and then ended up in Virginia for a while, um, then went to VCU, and yeah. ended up getting my undergrad from VCU, my BFA from there, and then ended up staying in Richmond, um, mm -hmm. gosh, maybe like for four years after that, so a pretty, I lived in Richmond for almost nine years before moving here for grad school. Mm -hmm. um, and this is with your family all these all this has been with your family moving from place to place yeah yeah I mean um we, we lived in I moved with my family to Virginia and then because um you know like this sort of this funny thing about like thinking about states like I couldn't go back to Michigan to go to college with a lot of my friends from high school because I was now out of state um and so I had to like decide to go to either like um I mean, I looked at a different a different schools in D.C., but primarily it was like, well, you know, Virginia is the obvious place. I can get in state yeah. tuition, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, I ended up staying there and then moving out, obviously, to go to undergrad. And then, um, yeah, but earlier in Michigan, like, to Virginia, those were moves with my family. Gotcha. And uh, you're, what, what are you doing now? You're in grad school, but are you, like, first year, second year? How many years are there yeah, in your grad school? So, like, never SU is a three-year program. Three years. See, that's the thing. Like, I was trying to think, like, what is happening over three years of grad school? I mean, like, I... It goes by pretty fast. You'd be surprised. And I had people tell me this when I was applying to grad school. Um, they'd be like, the two-year program flies by. The three-year program actually goes a lot faster than you think. Uh -huh. um, and they were right. Like... It, um, I'm in mean my second year, well, I ended my second year a couple of weeks ago, and so now, you know, this fall will be the beginning of my third year, um, and it Oh, great, so you're almost, one more year. Yeah. How do you like Syracuse? What's, what's happening in Syracuse? What, what is the vibes? Oh, it's the vibe in Syracuse. <laughs> oh, um. You can be PC for this answer if you'd like. Well, you know, it's, I'll say this is my first time living in the true, like, truly, like, the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I grew up in Michigan, which is, like, I mean, it's, like, very Midwestern. Like, I had family in Chicago, so we'd, like, go to Chicago a lot. So I grew up very much with these, like, Midwestern cities and this, like, very Midwestern um, environment. And the Northeast feels so different in this. And, of course, lived in the South for a while. But, like, it's weird. The Northeast is, to me... It's, I mean, it's a lot of different things, of course, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've never experienced anywhere quite like this. I'll just keep gotcha. it that. <laughs> and how did you, how did you start, how did you get into art in the first place? Oh, gosh, I, um, I grew up with a mom who was very, um, like actively artistic. I don't like to use the word like, my mom was really creative. It's like, I mean, that's so like, I feel like, I think everybody is creative in their own way, you know, so I think saying it that way is sort of vague, but I think she was like actively artistic in that she would, you know, like, wand she would wander with us through like 
vintage stores and antique stores and thrift stores and just start to like pull things together and like play with things on our walls. So our house was, um, you know, like always decorated in like all of these really sort of like eclectic ways. Like she had prints, she had like Frida Kahlo prints on the wall like, oh. and like Andy Warhol prints that I don't think were like, you know, she probably like found them at some sort of thrift store or whatever, but it was something that, um, was just so familiar to me. And this was like elementary school. So I was really young at that point. Um, but then she was also really encouraging of like all different types of art projects. So I remember being, gosh, I mean like 10 years old and she had gotten all of this fat, like, this, like these ribbons from this thrift store. Uh, Cause again, we were doing a lot of thrifting and uh -huh. not really knowing like why we're buying these things, but there's like all these materials, right? Like, and so I was like, oh, I'm going to make these into bracelets. So I took these ribbons and I would like cut them and then like make them small enough to like wrap around somebody's wrist. And then I sewed buttons onto them on one side. Um, I mean, they were like, I mean, of course I was like 10 years old. They were horrible. Yeah, but, like, great. They were also amazing. And I made so many, so many of them. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like, random sort of projects like that, like, she was, we were always doing stuff like that together. I was thinking about this recently, um, about, like, one year we, you know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so we would do, like, Halloween costumes, like, all from scratch. And she got these plastic butterfly wings, and we decorated the shit out of these butterfly wings. Like, jewels and glitter and, like, paint. Um, and they were really big. They were, like, these huge butterfly wings. Um, and so like stuff like that, that I think, you know, now people would be like, oh, well, maybe that's craft, right? Like that's not uh -huh. like, and to me, it's like, I don't necessarily, um, there may not be a difference between, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't like ascribe to that. Um, I think that was really the beginnings of, you know, my mom really instilling the creative process in me that like actually has a sense of freedom in it. And that's something yeah. that, for example, like the institution doesn't teach you how to play and how important that is. Um, and so when I think about that, it's like, yeah, I actually got, I got that from my mom. I got that from like people around me and what she exposed mm -hmm. me to at a young age. That wasn't museums. Like I didn't go to museums or galleries as a young kid. Um, yeah. Like I said, I was roaming through thrift stores <laughs> with my yeah, mom. Yeah, yeah. Like, and did you, what, so when did you take your first photograph? Um, yeah, so that came much later. It wasn't until you know, I'm like doing these crafts, painting, drawing, all that kind of stuff. Um, up until probably high school. So maybe in like the end of high school, it wasn't until that year I moved to Virginia, um, that I started to make more photographs. And it was with like one of those crappy Sony point and shoots. Um, you know, this is like 2008 probably. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just hanging out with my family, going to the beach, like whatever, which is sort of funny because when you look at the photos in the book, like those are actually really, um, like that there's a long history of me photographing my siblings in those types of environments. Yeah. Um, I will start showing people pictures of the book as you explain stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah sure. cause we did oh, like, uh, we kind of made this book almost chronological. I don't know if it's truly chronological order, but we tried as hard as we could to make it so that it goes from uh, young to older. So you'll see this guy. Remember, remember the face because this and face the will length of hair. Oh yeah, that yeah, the face and the length of hair keeps going. Uh, so if you explain a little bit, I'll just keep showing the book, and you just explain like what the project's about. Yeah. So. Um photographing my siblings in these types of environments when I say these types of environments it's like going to the beach playing at the park um and they were two and four at the time really really young um and so like, you know, talking about that last year of high school when I moved to Virginia um I had no friends um no, like I didn't really like anybody in my high school and I don't really think they liked me very much uh it was not a good fit and so I spent, and in hindsight, it was one of the best years of my life because I spent so much time with my family. And I really got to see my two siblings, Tanya and Kaya, featured in the book. Um, I got to spend so much time with them and really see them through that year before I went, you know, away and moved to, to Richmond for college. Um, and so the book, which in those early images that I'm talking about now, which is really how I got into photography, was through documenting them. 
Mm -hmm. um, those aren't featured here, but really what's featured is like the continuation of that project um, that really has lasted, I guess you could probably say almost 12 years now. Uh -huh. And is it con ongoing? Yeah, it's still ongoing. So, you know, it ebbs and flows. Like, um, as of right now, you know, they are currently living with my partner and I. And so um, I'm more concerned. So wait, about, sorry, like, wait, wait. Everyone is there? Yeah, so we're all here. <laughs> How many people are here? out in Vegas, but the kids are with us for now. Um, wow. So, you know, I'm more concerned with, like, us just kind of being okay and, like, you yes, know, more so than trying to photograph them right now. Um and over the years, it's ebbed and flowed. Like, a lot of the images in the book are fairly recent, but there's still ones from, like, past years. And so it varies, but it's very much still ongoing. Gotcha. And so, okay, about the quarantine. So how many people are in your place now? Like, how many people are four living with you? Four. Four. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. And how old are your siblings now? 14 and 16. Wow, still, like, so young. Yeah. They were still really, really young. How is everybody dealing with the quarantine up there? I mean, what what is? I'm guessing everything has changed. Have you done? Were you teaching as well when you mm -hmm. like? What are you teaching? What were you teaching? Uh, so I normally teach darkroom, but this semester I was teaching a digital class, and so it was just like a you know sort of like an intro digital class, and um, so when everything went online, it was like kind of bizarre and weird to try to translate a photo class online but um we kind of made do and mm -hmm. um shifted things it's been um i mean it's you know it's sort of everything every, everything's so different because based on where you are i think because we're in new york state things have felt really severe um even though we're like four hours away from the city yeah um, yeah the new york state thing it's like everywhere got the same type of treatment i think right and um so, yeah, I mean, but we're, I mean, I can speak to us that it's, you know, we've had bad days, we've had good days, you know, it's sort of touch and go day by day. Yeah, and so do you have, um, do you, what's the last photo book you've purchased? Oh, the last photo book I purchased, like recently, the most recent photo book I purchased? Hmm. You tell me. Um... Gosh, like all my photo books are at my studio, which I don't have access to. But like, so, yeah, that's unfortunate. Like, you can't even go in to get your stuff. It's just there. Yeah, I, I literally have access to none of my things. But um, I'm looking over the table across the room, and there's pictures from home by Larry Sultan, the notion of family, mm -hmm. Latoya Frazier, and then um, Rosemary Cromwell's newest book about Cuba is on top of it as well. That's just like I'm literally looking. Like oh, like the the yellow the yellow yeah. TIS book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Those are those are the homies. Uh, do you um? So, who are your biggest influences? Like, what what were you influenced by to make your work? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's somewhat Sorry, like, like I can't turn this significant that I have pictures of home just like sitting on a table in my bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah totally. <laughs> right and so I mean I think for me um it's also like again it's it's a I'm primarily working with photographs but I think a lot of times I think um in scenes so like, throughout the book there's these different still images that for me I constructed while visualizing some sort of like movement and seeing it first in my head as like as like a moving image and so um you know, one of the things that really influenced me last, this past year was this film called Miss Purple, directed by Justin Chan. Um, uh -huh. And it's about, it's like about a sibling. <laughs> I keep it classy, baby. I'm not playing. <laughs> um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so Miss Purple um, is about a sibling relationship. Uh -huh. And uh, it was like one of the it's an Asian Asian American film about a um, Korean family growing up in LA, and it was like the first time I'd ever seen a film that really followed one like specifically an Asian American experience. Um, but that uh -huh. really, but the main two main characters are a brother and a sister, and it's like how they're navigating um, a lot of these like struggles like within the family and their how they navigate their own relationship within that context. Um, I 
think it's on. Gosh, it's on Hulu. Well, just name it again. People will find it. Miss you don't Marvel. have to tell them where to get it. Yeah, but Miss what was the name of the piece? It's the film's called Miss Purple, by, and it's directed by Justin Tron. Miss Purple, I'll write that down. Um, yeah. I was wondering about that. Like, so your your background is, uh, you know, not just like American. Where where are your people's from? I mean, if you don't mind me asking, I'm just trying to figure out. Like, you just said like, like, what, where are your people's from? Like, what's uh, where? Yeah, no, where my get... people's from, I think, is really significant in you know discussing my background and my work. My dad was uh, born in the Philippines and then immigrated to the United States when he was around ten, eleven. And mm-hmm. then my mom's family is from South Africa, um, and we they came. Um, like before my mom was born. So my mom was born, is the only one of her siblings born here. Uh huh. Gotcha. And yeah, complicated shit. <laughs> I dig it. Uh, my wife is also a uh, quarter Filipino, so, um, and she's worked with a lot of Asian um, rights, uh, Asian American rights organizations in New York City and Jersey. And it's just like, you know, anyway, I, uh, anyway, I, I, I digress. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a relationship with anybody you consider a mentor? Like, uh, how, how did you, like, really start to, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be a mentor how you started to love photography. I'm wondering how you, what made you want to go to grad school for three years for photography? Mm-hmm. Like, the, yeah. Oh, God. What and before it? you answer, if anybody else has questions, please ask them. We, if you can't ask them through, if there's no question box on below, please just comment the questions and we will answer questions as we go along. I, I'm reading, I'll, I'm reading them. So please, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, what made me want to grad school? So really the thing that made me want to go to grad school for three years was um, the fact that I had such a difficult time in undergrad. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's sort of a weird thing in that I I felt really called to come to grad school because I felt like I there was a lot of work I wanted to make specifically about my family and that I had I couldn't when I was an undergrad I was dealing with so many other things that um, there was work that I felt like I did that was still left undone mm-hmm. and grad school was the reason to go back for that and so it wasn't really any person in any person in particular, it was more so this like gnawing feeling in my gut that it was like, it's like the project or the work that like won't let you sleep until you make it. Yeah. Um, And I felt like grad school was, would would give me like the form and the structure to do that. I don't think it's necessary or required at all to, to have, you know, a three year MFA program to do that. But um, for me, that was, the impetus for being like, okay, um, let's go to grad school. I'm also very known for being particularly impulsive about really big life decisions. So. What's another life decision that you've been like super impulsive about? Um, Are you willing uh, to tell so us? So when I was in undergrad, I decided in October that I was going to study abroad in January. Um, uh-huh which put me an entire year, quote unquote, behind. To me, it was right on time um, for graduation. (laughs) And um, I didn't speak Spanish. I'd never been to Spain. I'd only been out of the country a handful of times. Um, Did your mom speak Spanish? No. No, nobody in my family is too Spanish. I mean, like, there are some words in Tagalog that are like, but it's it's not like, oh, you yeah, speak Tagalog, you can speak. It's, it's not, not the same. No, yeah, yeah, no so. way. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. And I went and lived with a family I'd never met. And, um, yeah, it, it was like two, three months of planning, and I was gone on my own. So, what's, why did you hate VCU is the real question. That's what that's what I'm trying uh, <laughs> You don't have to. You don't have to explain this. I'm just interested to know, like in this in these crazy times, in these COVID, these COVID times, uh, <laughs> that higher education is going to take a, a hit, right? Like, um, and I'm just wondering, like, like what, uh, what about higher education has, has has like made you not feel good? Like, what what part of that was not the experience uh, that you? Paid I mean, for? the like white supremacy part, you know. 
like yeah. Not- <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The like heteropatriarchy also is not very comfortable. Um, it's a, it's a, both both <laughs> are overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't have to go very far down on the Google search page when you search Syracuse University in particular to find out about what's taking place on campus here. Um, yeah. So I, it, took, it didn't take me long either when I was there for the summer last summer. It was yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. like two days. Oh, okay. I get it. I get it. Yeah, I mean, I I struggle, and I talk about this really often, um, with this question of, like, yeah, like, why, to I, I, myself, right? Like, why am I here? Why am I actually um, getting an MFA degree? Like, what, yeah, what, what, like, just, like, the whole construct, right? Like, what am I doing here? Like, who is this for? Like, who is my work for? Um, I mean, who went before is a rhetorical question. I know that answer, but, um, you know, I think for me, it's been, and still is a struggle and I don't think it's for everybody. Um, and yeah. in all honesty, like, if well, are you talking about undergrad or grad now? Are you talking about all? Uh, I'm talking about both, I think. Yeah. And I think if I actually, this is a question of mentorship. Like, if I had had somebody, I think, before going to undergrad um, who had mentored me, I really wish I would have had somebody who would have said, you know, this is what, this is the reality of, like, what this is going to be like. Um, yeah. Where, where did you get that? I mean. No, I mean, I'm saying I didn't have that. Like, I'm talking. I know, but have you got it now? No, I mean. Not really. It's like, you know, it, and it makes sense that you wouldn't, you know, somebody who, you know, like when you're in academia, it's like, um, you know, everybody sort of wants to and who participates in it. Like, we all want to believe that it's something. Um, I, At least. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, it's, you know, it's, I end up being sort of my, me, myself and other people who are having similar conversations end up being um, really sort of, like, looked at as these odd ones who are being like, wait, like, why are we here? What are we doing here? Like, why does this exist? Um, Should it exist? Oh, yeah, well, uh, now you're in it, right? You're, you're like, more than halfway through. Oh, yeah. Should there, is it necessary? Are you finding it that, like, it's actually worthwhile to get this master's? Um, I know, this is, like, a crazy question. I mean... I know this is a hard ass question to answer, like <laughs> because this. <laughs> but I'm very interested because I don't have a grad degree, right? Like I just have an undergrad degree, and I've been like writing that out, you know. But I don't, I'm unsure if um, I'm unsure. I'm, I I think about grad school. You know, my wife has a grad degree. Uh, a lot of photographers that actually, yeah. I see that having a grad degree in the art world um, makes you uh, something more. In a way, uh, it's it, it depends on the grad school you go to. Of course, I mean, there's a lot of grad schools that are, you know, considered uh, uh, more like substantial for a career than others. Uh, yeah. But I had this conversation with I forgot who I was talking to today, but I was having a conversation about. Well, I was having a, a long ass conversation about some other art shit that I don't like. Like you know the kind of why do I see uh, why do I see like a Stephen Shore picture every day like in my Instagram feed? I don't, like those things kind of annoy me a little bit. When there's so many new photographers doing like shit that's actually kind of meaningful for culture now, mm. but that's besides the point. That's besides. Yeah. The point. Uh, <laughs> please go on with your uh, yeah, like. What, what do you think? Like, well, how, what do you? Think? Well, I mean, I think like it's with any industry, right? Like it's the the so called art world, which we're the only. It's the only industry that doesn't refer to itself as like a real industry which I think uh-huh. is part of the, like, intelligence of its marketing. Um, but when you yeah, think about piece, it, yeah. right? Like, yeah, like, the art world, like, that's... Art, art business. I think that there has to be a separation between... Sure. There's the photo business, the photo world, the art world, the art business. And these things are all very separate, right? Like, right, but of course, like, you know, integrated and, like, dependent upon each other. Um, but I think mm-hmm. with anything, it's like, yeah, you know, it's like you... We have these systems that are set up that deem 
certain people more worthy in their work more worthy than others because of a title because of a number of you know a few letters this isn't like you know somebody you know who's getting like an md like you want the person who's going to be doing the work as an md like you want that person to have the letters it's like that's not <laughs> this is this isn't that you know like and i think yeah. um you know i i i don't think that you should have to get an MFA um, to feel like your work is seen and valued by, you know, any art community that you want to be in. Um, True. You know, there's a lot. Well, we hope so. I mean, because not, not many of us have them. I mean, they're, they're very, they're not cheap to get. Uh, Even if you get like scholarships, they're still not cheap because you can't really work. So you're just kind of losing when you... Yeah, you I mean, even, even people. people who, yeah, even with funding, like, there's still, like, especially if you're, like, if you come from, if you're black or brown or coming from any sort of marginalized identity, it takes something from you, um, even if you... What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? I mean, to, like, be within, like, the system of higher education <laughs> that is not... is was, like, you know, deliberately created to, to like... With, without marginalized folks in mind. Yeah, without it, the consent of the marginalized. It takes, you know, it takes something, from, like, from your soul. <laughs> you know, and it's it's incredibly exhausting. Um, and yeah. some places are changing faster than others. Some are making that change a priority. Um, so why did you choose Syracuse? Um, I was really, really, really... Uh, interested in a three-year program. That was one of my major decision points. Um, and the reason for that was... Why? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. I wanted more time. Mm-hmm. Um, I also felt like the compression of a two-year program was something I wasn't interested in. I had taken, like, four years off after undergrad, and I really, like, enjoyed having what I felt was, like a balance in life, you know, I think when you have a two-year program, it makes that really difficult because you have to take, you have to take the exact same amount of work and compress it into two years. Yeah. Um, And I wanted to sort of stretch that out of it. Gotcha. And there's some questions. So I'm going to go back to some of the questions that were asked. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Stephen Shore was a question. Uh, Stephen Shore is one of the most popular photographers of all time. He's had shows at every major museum in the, country and maybe the like most of the photo world i would say that his work is kind of seminal to the to the to photography uh although it is doesn't really i mean there's not much uh you know i'm not going to talk i'm not going to talk too bad about stephen shore we love stephen shore he's a professor we're not going to talk too bad about him i think that he's a great photographer and we need him in our we need him in our existence i mean he's made most some of the most the best photographs of all time. So we won't talk too much about like his, the negatives. Uh, what other art forms inform your practice or non-art forms? Um, so before I, you answer, uh, the, there, there's questions that were earlier than that question that I can't actually see back now, but if you have the question that you asked earlier on, please ask it again, please. So that we can answer it for you. And yes, go on. Um, so I'm really heavily influenced by, um, like fiction and like narrative fiction specifically from like written by and for black women. So like Mm -hmm. even, so like the, I mean the quote for the the title of the book is from Toni Morrison, um, who is like a very, very strong influence for me in so many ways. I think especially in terms of like talking about creative process. Yeah. Um, I think so much about like how somebody makes work versus sometimes what the work is that they're making. Um, And so I think that to me, I think helps me, even if it's not a medium that I particularly use, like I don't consider myself a writer, um, especially not like a novelist, but like thinking about how she comes to her ideas, how she talks about her ideas, the intention behind them, things like that um, are really influential to me. Her documentary, um, is also is on Hulu and is absolutely phenomenal. Um, ah, very good. Good to know. Good to know that I am. It's really good. Um, everybody, sh- everybody should watch it. Um, and then um, the question was about like non art related, right? So, um, but yeah, so like I think 
like novels, fiction. Um, I took a black feminist theories class here at SC my first semester, and that was like enormously influential in terms of like in just like so many ways, but especially in terms of um, art making. Um, mm. I think especially in thinking about just talking about like, you know, like you're making work, I think specifically as like a Blasian black American woman and um, the work that I make and like how my work is perceived is always going to be like racialized and politicized. Like that's just the world I live in. And so being able to like engage with these ideas um, surrounding my work is also really important. And so reading a lot of, like, black feminist texts and, like, transnational yeah. feminisms have really also been really important for me. And as far as the, um, well, that brings me to, well, I mean, I'm thinking about some whole other shit, but, like, if you're, I have this, well, okay, so as a, as a black person making artwork, mm -hmm. um, are you seeing trends in, like, recently there's been a lot of, like, you know, black photographers, um, getting some gaining popularity in a like in a way that they ne we never had before and i'm just wondering like is there um to me it seems like there's a lot of uh work that's being portrayed like it's it's still very difficult to be a black landscape photographer that's all i'll say i'll, I'll say like it's mm -hmm. like there's a lot of body issue work there's a lot of uh portraiture but i don't see that we are allowed to make like landscapes like, mm -hmm. yeah no I, mean, I think about it in the same way about like abstract work right mm -hmm. which like this was also very much an issue for a lot of um you know like black artists working in like the 70s and 80s in terms of like i'm making abstract like just literally like huge abstract paintings um i think it's still something that i don't want to i don't necessarily want to articulate it as an issue but i think it's definitely um a point like a qu questions that need to be asked um, yeah. right? Like what does it mean to like make abstract work as a black artist? Um, yeah. And how is that portrayed in the world that doesn't, you know, like needs to, uh, stereotype, uh, an art world that requires stereotyping is what I would say. And I think, well, I think also it's like that, um, in terms of like, also like visual, like the visualization aspect of it, it's like, um, and I think I, I think about this a lot in terms of like what does it mean to take intimate photos of people that I'm close to, like my family members specifically, and to like put them out into the world, um, and that sort of exposure, you know, yeah. um, that in a lot of ways like the white gaze really loves. Um, <laughs> Would you? Uh... Would you explain what you think the white gaze is to the to the to the peoples? What what I think the white gaze is um, in photography, not in like the world. I mean, that's oh, yeah, way like too much. Because um, there's been a lot of like the, there's been a lot of interesting kind of conversation um, in the last few weeks because of the like ain't bad shit, and I don't know if anybody else mm -hmm. knows about this kind of stuff that's going on with the company uh, book company named Ain't Bad. I, I think that the guys are, they're fine guys, but, you know, there's just some issues with the way they choose the work they they want to portray or put into their publications. And um, I, I'm, I'm trying to, as, you know, as a publisher, I want to kind of be the opposite of that. Like, I want to kind of uh, not even deal with those kinds of issues. So it's, for me, it's, it's an interesting kind of time. It's an interesting time that, in the white and black gaze of, of the world. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, well, how do you, what, what is your, well, the demographics of your grad program? Um, I, how many of there are this? There's. In your year, at least. In, oh, in my year, I'm the only black person. Uh-huh. And how many people total in the, like, the, is it photography? Is it visual arts? What's the program like? Um, it's in photo and um, it's specifically art photography. And there are, um, out of all of us, I mean, how many are there? It's like, I can't be quoted on this because it's really bad. I can't remember. There's like the 14 or 15 of us. Mm -hmm. um, three POC folks. Um, 
and the rest are all white people. And so, I mean, I think the conversation about, like, what we're talking about in terms of, like, the white gaze and, like, who's doing the looking relates to the experience of what it means to also be black in academia and higher education and what that experience is like. What is that? I mean, I don't know because I have my bachelor's from. I mean, it's years not ago. that. I mean, of course, it depends on where you go, right? Like a lot of uh-huh. places are very different. There's people have very different experiences depending on where they go. Um, I think if you're a very specific, if you're specifically at like an overwhelmingly white institution, it can be um, a place in which you know, like if you. I think this is also related to. Um, you know, like, talking about film and, like, who's doing the, you know, writing of the films, who, whose films are getting made. Um, I think yeah. all of these conversations are the same. Yeah, true. I mean, that our worlds kind of are colliding, especially because art, like, photography is becoming more video-esque. But there's a kind of a, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's all going to video, for sure. I mean, in five years, we're making videos. I mean, that's how I, that's how I see it. But um, I'm going to ask some, like, lightning round questions because I still have a list of shit that I didn't even ask yet, but there's also yeah, no, questions from, from the crowd. So do you think your work, and every question now is two sentences. If you can do two-sentence answers, we can keep it, like, because we're running yeah, out of time, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. I mean, anyway. Uh, so do you think your work or your process would be different had you been self-taught? Um, I'm not sure it would have gotten me to different work or if my process would be different. Um, I think I'd overall be in a very different place in -hmm. terms of like, um, maybe like I wouldn't, you know, like maybe I wouldn't be, have been like, maybe I would have been like firm and like, actually I don't need grad school at all, you know, Mm. or, um, Uh things like that. But um, I would have definitely avoided a lot of suffering. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, How do you continue to learn and educate yourself? What do you recommend for others? Mm. Let's see the first question first. How do you continue to learn and educate yourself? Um, I'm always looking at a variety of things, I think. For me, it's, like, a matter of, um, like, either, like, reading, like, I talked about fiction, or maybe it's, um, like, a sort of, like, theory text, like, you know, what I was talking about earlier with, like, reading a lot of Black feminist theory, or maybe it's, um, even, like, engaging in, like, poetry, or maybe it's, like, watching a TV show. It's, like, I'm constantly yeah. trying to... Are you addicted to a TV show right now? By the way, um, I am not. Although I crushed Shit's Creek in like a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I, we've been here for sixty days. That took a week or two to like. I, I that is a crushed. All I like Shit's Creek. Creek. That's a good show. That's a good um, show. It's so. Would, anyway, sorry. No, I would say uh, regular friend for others. I mean, I would say just like do like engage in the things that um make you feel excited and that like really bring something out within you that makes you feel alive no matter what it is because i think we can sort of be like oh that's not connected it's like it absolutely is connected um yeah i think that it's i I think that people um well a lot of artists or you know art makers feel so much pressure with making art because they want the art to actually exist outside of their own head Mm -hmm. or their own like space their own computer screen their own dark room their own this and that but like I think that it has to be all in your head, all in the dark room, all on your computer screen. And then the world will take it. Uh, you can't, you can, you can never know what somebody else will think of the work until you yeah. actually make work that you're happy with yourself. So I think that that's kind of, uh, that's what I would say in response to the same question. How can photography impact the COVID-19 crisis? Good question. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> This one's a hard. This one's like actually a, 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 a quite a difficult. Quite, it's very broad. I think that photography is everything anyway. I mean, video is just a bunch of stills in a row at thirtieth of a frame or thirtieth of a second. So you know, photography explains everything. I mean, we get our news from a photographic art form. We get our 
Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to answer this question. Again. Uh, we, get, like, we get all of our information from photographs. If we had to read everything, not all, but a lot. More than reading, we get a lot of information from the photographs before we start reading the article. Like if I see an article that you know has bad text and, and a bad photograph, it's probably not getting written or read. Uh, if I see a, a great photograph and a decent like line of text, I'll probably click on that article. Uh, anyway, uh, do you have an answer for this, or can we like? Um, I mean, I think I think it's like yeah, it's I don't I don't think that we can actually answer that yet because it's still, yeah, it's still happening. Yeah, it's um, still happening. In a lot of ways, yeah. Uh huh. And how do you feel about the bookmaking process? Can you explain the process on your end? Because from my end, it was like I we met each other a few times, and I really loved the work, and I thought that it was. Um, I knew that it was an ongoing project and we don't need a finished project to make the books that we make because we consider them a mix between kind of an art project, a periodical and a book. So it's a yeah. mix of these things for me. And I was like, at this point, it looks real good. And I know that it will change just like we, we made a book with uh, a photographer named Zora J. Murph, mm -hmm. which is about Omaha. Um, yeah, yeah. And he, it wasn't the end of the project. It was just the photography piece of a larger um larger amazing project that you should all check out if you can and yeah, he, he made another book after we made our book and both have sold out pretty much i mean we have a few copies of my book but his book's pretty actually i have a few copies of his book also that i will be selling to like museums and shit but uh, but yeah like it doesn't like it, it how do you feel about the book making yeah. process? um i mean i think it's like i think like one of the things that with this book in particular was like, I mean, the way that you had it sort of laid out initially, which is like semi chronological, not, you know, exact, yeah, um, yeah. really fit. Um, I mean, I think there are so many different ways to make a book. Um, I mean, it's just like, it's like, in, like it's just like, it's an infinite number of different ways you can make a book. Yeah. I think, um, like you know I've like handmade books before which again is like a very different process um but I think for me it was like fairly straightforward I would say especially with the selection of images um I think yeah. especially the, the fact that like you pared down a lot of the images initially um, and we went back and forth to kind of figure out which, uh, like you know, you gave me more images and yeah. you wanted something back in or I wanted something out or like kind of, we, it was a process. It was a, I think it was a few months that we just kind of processed the book ourselves and kind of right. figured out what made sense in, in this project and to leave it open-ended, like, you know, this is not the end of the game, right? This mm -hmm. is the peak. And then we, we, you know, your future is bright. So it's like, you know, there's going to be more books, you know, definitely more books. Uh, how do you put blackness into landscape? This is a question that maybe I spurred. Yeah. Uh, I love that. So I'm just going to answer this one really quick because now we have no time left. So I'm just going to kind of like, how do you put blackness in the landscape? Well, because we live here and we're part of the society, the landscape has pretty much uh, negated us as part of it. I mean, you can see the, 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 um, Blackness in the landscape is gentrification, racism in the landscape, like maybe uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia, or, um, you know, if you, like, think about the the Parthenon that they built in Nashville, which was, when no one knows this exists, they built a one-to-one -one ratio Parthenon, the like Greek Parthenon in Nashville. It's there, and it was built by white supremacists back in the, like, turn of the century, or, like, 19-somethings, like, early 1900s. And black people were not allowed in this park. It was just, it was, you know, anyway, so that's like, it's about the, that's the landscape of, of, uh, gen, of racism that I, that I see. Like, or, like I photographed the murder scenes of like where black people were killed by police officers, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, white gaze, white gaze is a, a question that we, I think we answered. How do you feel about the book, book making process? Was it challenging? How was it with Chris? That's a fun question. Let's answer the last one. How was it with Chris? Did I like? Totally I mean, you made you, you made it incredibly easy. I think, like I said, like I, one of my biggest challenges um, as a photographer and as an artist is like I really struggle with editing. Um, it is mm -hmm. really difficult for me to edit down, um, and so I think like it was just so easy, like being able to be like, okay, this is pretty much everything I have from this project. 
what yeah. are you drawn to? What do you think? What images do you think are really speaking to each other? Yada yada, and how so? Um, so for me, I was like, it's yeah, you know, it was like. What did you? Because I, I, on my end, I'm looking at a bunch of photographs. I, I look at a lot of photographs, like tons and tons of photographs all the time, and I like a certain type of photograph, but um, maybe. You don't like. I know that other people have ideas about photographs that I don't have. Like I'm very like kind of. I would even say like kind of German in the way I like a photograph, like super uh, formal, but also kind of has some. If you can be formal as well as have feeling, then that's when I love a photograph. But that's not like most people don't really respond to that, like kind type of new topographic style. Mm -hmm. That's where I grew up. That's like my like that's my home right so that's how i see photography now i just want to kind of change it a little bit so that it's not just like the germans making the photographs like so it's it's a it's the, that's how i see it uh if there, are there, can you read a line from the book for us oh shit i mean like can you just read the the, the, the beginning because it's it's not too long should i just re should i read both paragraphs uh just read it yeah why not do it okay um, a sister can be seen as someone who is both ourselves and very much not ourselves, a special kind of double. Uh, like I said, Toni Morrison. Body of work documenting my two youngest siblings, Kaya, born in 2004, and Tandiswa, born in 2006. As their older sister of 13 and 15 years, I began photographing them from a place of nostalgia, seeking to create an archive of images to serve as evidence of our existence, significance, and humanity in a world that seeks to erase us. Although this book only features Tandi and Kaya, it serves as a love letter to all five of my younger siblings. As the eldest child, they are my best friends and my greatest loves. Our special bonds have their own rhythm, power, and magic that only belong to us. This work provides you a glimpse into our world, one full of play and innocence that grants refuge and solidarity in the face of trauma, traumas and struggles unique to us as black youth in America. Not in Accorda. Awesome. Well, okay, cool. So we're almost done here. Um, I'm just going to say shout outs to my boy, Ricky Keeley. If you're still on the, 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 the thingy, thanks for being part of the lost project with us. Um, if you, Nadia, do you have any questions for me? Like after seeing this book, real ass questions. Oh, after seeing the book, <laughs> real ass questions. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I feel like we'll have a, a private conversation, but is there anything that like we can, you know, like do you have any questions for me? I've been asking you questions for like. Well, I mean, I think it's time. like, what made you <coughs> want to start a publishing company? You talked about like a little bit of what you want the publishing. Company. Like, what made you want I to start a publishing company? I wanted a gallery, really. I I started with the gallery like about um, in two thousand nine, and uh, I ran that gallery with my cousin for about two and a half years, and. The problem was I didn't want to sell things that were inaccessible to the people that I like, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm selling things to like people that have money and are not friends. They're not friendly. It's just like a, it's a, um, it's a transaction, right? It's different than like having people that you're on this ride with for a long time. So I realized that the book world was somewhere where it wouldn't cost me too much to make the project happen, especially with the artist help. Like you sold, enough pre-orders on your own so that we could cover your costs for the book. You're like, you didn't have to come out of pocket. I didn't have to come out of pocket. And that, that was perfect. I mean, it worked perfectly. Um, and of course your work is amazing. So I think that it's just like kind of that, that was the mix. It was a great mix for me. I, I want to work with artists that are um, trying to do something a little different with the photography. I'm not trying to make a bunch of photographic books of like, you know, I'm not trying to make Steve McCurry style book. You know, it's not, that's not my deal. Right. Like it's like not what I'm here for. And it's definitely not what, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, I was thinking a little bit differently about work, uh, but now it seems like there's um, no one's going to, I don't, do you know any other black publishers? For specifically like photo art books? Any art. Any um, art. I mean like of text. Right, like of literally like coming out with like readers and like text, but like, um, not for photo art books now. Yeah, so I now feel like I have a little bit like a tiny piece of pressure, <laughs> and it's not even this year. Like now, I feel it. Like during COVID, I feel the pressure to work with artists that are you know 
not the not not of the norm not of not usually of the 90 percent of people that go to grad school or like kind of right. working with artists that you know struggled through their undergrad education to make work and are still making work 10 years after that working a full job as well as trying to get better at making artwork and they're learning and i'm learning with them and i think that that's why you know that's kind of the way i, I see the the progression of the publishing company I don't even think it's a publishing company. I'm not distributed. We make just 250, 300 or to 500 of a book. It's not really, uh, it's like kind of, I love making these books. I love the art that I put like that we have in the books. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like if people buy them, great. If people don't buy them, eh, fuck it. You know, like what, what are you going to do? Like, just kind of like you made I, I don't care. Like, I don't care about the sales so much, you know, more for now because it's like COVID, it's COVID easy time. But, um, uh, Without the Covizi times, I would not really care about sales at all because I have day jobs. You know, I, I make photographs for a living. So this is kind of the, this is the fun. Yeah, this it takes is the, the, it takes the like, pressure off. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, now, I still don't really feel any pressure. I just, maybe I'm just stupid. I don't feel pressure in like the world at all because I know that it's fucked up. I know that the country's fucked up. Uh, I grew up with it being fucked up. But it's not changing. It's getting worse. But it's, uh, right now I'm okay. I mean, I have a very supportive family and wife, and that's very helpful um, for feeling like you're <laughs> for the feels. But um, <laughs> but yeah, that's you know, it's I I feel like this is it. Like we have like a minute. We have a minute. So I'm just gonna say thank you for Nadia for being on this call. Nadia's book is here. I think that you should own this book. We made 250 copies of this. And I think about 50, uh, 50 or 60 are gone or 70 are gone. So they will sell out within the year. I, I, that is the that is a promise. So if you want this book, please get it. Um, and, you know, we have 30% off on the website now. This book is not for 30% off because we don't have it to ship yet. Um, but anyhow, it was really great to speak to you, Nadia. And thank you so much for being on the call thank with us. Thank you for having me and giving me a reason to, like, you know, put on earrings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. It's like I, it's like I rushed back in to this house. Like my wife was driving about fifty miles an hour to get back to this house on time because we were at a beach, which is lucky because we're on the Cape and we get to go to a beach. It was really beautiful, and but then it was like, oh shit, we gotta like get back home. Like I didn't forget. I was gonna take this call in the car and just like kind of continue when we got home. But because uh, nine oh five was perfect, I'm glad you came in at nine oh five. But thank you so much for being here. And, thank you. Um, thank you. Everybody. Because we need to do this in person as soon as we can. Uh, and next year we'll be relaunching this book at every fair that exists. I mean, this year we get to do no fairs, but next year we get to do fucking all the fairs, everything. All we go fairs. to Europe. We're going to Amsterdam. We're going to London. We're going to Paris. We'll be in New York, L.A., Philly, uh, Atlanta. We'll go to Denver. We'll go to Portland. We'll go to Chicago. We'll go to Cleveland. We'll go to Vancouver. Anyway, thank you for being here. Uh, and we won't even have books available then because they'll be gone by that point. We're going to sell 